everything I did in sport has just like, I mean, it's dictated the rest of my life. I'm not a person that attaches memories to things. Like my Olympic experiences, many of them ended with medals. Those medals don't define what the experience was. Growing up, I got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Let's just say I was an Olympic delinquent. I grew up in a family environment that was really difficult. My dad struggled much of his life with alcoholism. My parents split up when I was nine years old and my sister and I both basically hit the streets. We both had a lot of issues, drugs and alcohol. That started when I was 12 years old. And by the time I was 16, I wasn't going to school anymore. I was drinking a lot, binge drinking, passing out and, you know, under street posts. Just wanted to self-destruct. And what happened that afternoon in 1988 is I was flipping through the channels, completely bored out of my skull, had a pack of smokes in my pocket. And what I came upon that afternoon from Calgary was the Winter Olympics. Gaetan Boucher gaining his last race for Canada was the defending Olympic champion. And when I watched Gaetan go off on world record pace and blew up so spectacularly with three quarters of a lap to go that he had to like hold his legs and then he was trying to finish and his coach was yelling at him. And when he crossed the line in ninth place, he was just like shaking his head like he failed. Seeing somebody hurt themselves so much for something, it was the first time I connected to something positive. And that afternoon, my life changed. I didn't know how or why or when or where, but I knew I was going to go to the Olympics. When I started speed skating as a 16-year-old, about a year and a half in, I was recruited by a cycling coach. I enjoyed it, and I just kept going, and it turned out really well. I was really strong, really fast, really good, and I won $700 in my first bike race. <laughs> I ended up doing my first Olympics as a road cyclist. After winning two bronze medals, that experience dictated my life. I ended up getting an eating disorder in the sport. I struggled with anorexia because I was in a sport that told me I was too big. I thought if I won something, it would make it all worth it. I thought if I won something, I wouldn't feel the worthlessness and the hopelessness and the helplessness. And when I won medals, my world came crashing down. Within months, I was in a state of major depression. I went from being the fittest and strongest I'd ever been to not being able to do anything other than eat, sleep, and cry. She's probably the most dedicated, hardworking individuals I ever met in my entire life by kind of breaking down all barriers from what she has been through as a person to what she became as an athlete. So as these young kids come onto the stage, can we give them a good old Aussie good day and welcome. I got the whooping cough about seven weeks before the games and was coughing and choking and, and not able to train. Eight days before the road race, I woke up to the news that one of my teammates had died in a crash. And I remember going to the washroom and looking at myself in the mirror and saying, who do you think you are? What are you here for? And if you can't do it for yourself, you will do it for Nicole. And I finished in second last place. Four days later, I did the time trial and I finished in sixth place, 23 seconds out of the bronze medal. Those races to this day are probably the two I'm most proud of because it taught me it's not about medals. It is about excellence and this beautiful thing called trying. And that's what brought me back to speed skating. I went back to speed skating at 27 years old. That's like, that's not even possible. I don't have ever seen this in the history of speed skating. Somebody who has not grown up with skates, who doesn't understand how to skate, like learning from your little child, her determination, her passion for the sport, her love to glide on the ice, made her the best in the world in this sport. In seven weeks, I made the national team. In three months, I was top 10 in the world at the World Championships. And 17 months later, 
I won my first Olympic medal on the ice. Torino 2006 is the only time I won the Olympics. <laughs> I was against the three-time defending Olympic champion Claudia Pechstein of Germany. And I remember looking at Claudia and thinking, she thinks she's going to win again. Something special is going to happen tonight. And when we started, I remember I was behind Claudia. And as the race went on, I was starting to catch her. And then as we got into two laps to go, all of a sudden, we were even. I hurt so much. But in that moment, I got lower and longer and stronger. And I attacked that race as if I was fighting for my life. And I remember almost crying from the pain and then getting to the final stretch and throwing my blade and then looking up at the time and seeing six minutes, 59 seconds and change and thinking my teammates skated seven minutes. I just won the Olympics. In Vancouver, my last winter Olympiad, I was the flag bearer for Canada. My 3,000 meters finishing in fifth place, and the 5,000 not winning again, but finishing third, but skating better than I ever had in my life. And when I crossed the line, I remember thinking, this is it. I'm done. I wanted to go back, and I wanted to do it the way I'd learned in speed skating. To do it in a way that was positive, was supportive, where I was good to myself, and the voices in my head were not ones that were tearing me apart, but ones that were supportive and encouraging. I finished in fifth place, and when I crossed the line, all I thought was, I'm done. And it was closure. Clara is a real inspiration in the sense that she recognizes her opportunity to give back, that these Olympic medals are, you know, a few inches thick when you stack them on top of each other, but uh, when you stand on top of those medals uh, as a podium for change, your voice gets heard. Former Olympic speed skater and cyclist Clara Hughes trained for this day in some weather that was pretty darn cold. We rode 11,100 kilometers. It was a massive initiative and did over 200 community events, 110 community visits. For her to take up the challenge of cycling around the country is unbelievable, frankly. And I was there the day she left from Toronto in the driving snow. She was, as she always is in that moment, unrelenting and committed to seeing it through. And that's exactly what she did. The ride wasn't about raising money. It was really about raising awareness. And any funds raised stayed in the communities for mental health initiatives. And it's something that you know, I'm still tired from. I still can't believe we pulled it off. And the first time I spoke about depression was in 2011. And I'm going to say it was the most important thing I did in my life. Every single day in my life, wherever I am in the world, a Canadian will come up to me and say, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for mental health. It is no longer about skating or cycling or medals or this or that or that race or that performance. It is about you let me know I'm not alone. And I always say thank you to anybody who talks to me because they're doing the same for me. It's like where I come from, I should never have gone on to do what I did. But if I can do it, so can anyone. <laughs> I was a kid that was transformed because of sport, and it fundamentally shifted the direction of my life. It's given me a life, and it's something I'll never forget, and that's why I give back. You can't take that incredible gift and keep it for yourself. You have to give it to others. <laughs>